and welcome to The Detour. I'm Adam Davis. Right here at the start of this episode, I've got a question for you. What do you think or feel when you hear the phrase, the American dream? Do you chuckle skeptically or tense up with anger? Or maybe in private, do you feel nostalgic or even just a little bit inspired? Of course, the American dream is a cliché. But it's a cliché that does a lot of work, and plenty of that work seems worthwhile. The more we can say America falls short of the dream, the more we can hold America to account. And the more we can point to lots of American dreams instead of just one, the more likely we are to be talking about this country in all its actual complexity and variety. But still, there's something about the cliched and outdated and overburdened and sometimes infuriating phrase, the American dream, that sticks. In this episode of The Detour, we talk with Omar el Akkad and Mitchell S. Jackson, two thinkers and authors who explore the American dream in vivid, wrenching, and challenging ways. They both get at core parts of the American dream, and in doing so, they get at core parts of this nation— at the United States of America and the myths, fictions, and hopes it produces and depends on. If you had to boil down the American dream, you might end up with the idea that you could own your own home, a quiet house on a corner, a white picket fence, evenings where you and your family and your neighbors hang out on the porch. Or you might see that scripted word equality somewhere in your head, or freedom to be who you are, to be left alone. Mitchell and Omar go deep on these ideas. Mitchell on the dream of homeowning and all it contains. Omar on the self-evident truths we claim to hold within this nation's borders. We talk to Mitchell and Omar as part of Oregon Humanities 2021-2022 Consider This series on the theme American Dreams, American Myths, American Hopes. These were pandemic conversations and emotional conversations and conversations that stirred the pot. We hope you enjoy and feel challenged by what Omar and Mitchell have to say, and we hope, as always, you'll let us know what you think. Here's Mitchell, first. Mitchell S. Jackson is a Pulitzer Prize-winning author and essayist and a professor at Arizona State University. He grew up in Portland, Oregon, and his books, The Residue Years and Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family, present a crackling portrait of a Portland you won't get in the New York Times, racially and economically complicated, full of barriers and of opportunities, and above all, alive in language, ambition, and strong human connection. And it's also worth saying that in all his writing, Mitchell is thinking about dreams, which for him are wrapped up in what it means to be a man, and a black man in particular. Mitchell's next novel, John of Watts is forthcoming from Farrer, Strauss, and Giroux. In his novel, The Residue Years, Mitchell writes about a character, Champ, who dreams of buying back a home on 6th and Mason in northeast Portland that he lived in briefly as a kid with his grandmother. I asked him about that home when we talked in October 2021. I'm I'm glad you asked about that home because it's an actual home Uh, I won't hand out any addresses for (laughs) someone to go by there, but it was um, the home of my great-grandmother, Edith Jackson. Um, And for me, it was a touchstone because she and my grandfather, who um, lived nearby, owned homes for all of my, really all of my life. Um, They So from the time I was born until they passed, they owned those homes. And so we were a little nomadic or itinerant in our um, living sometimes, but I always knew that I could go back to uh, Six and Mason. Um, And some of my fondest memories are there. Um, She was a religious woman. She was from the deep South. She's from Alabama. She would gather up all the kids, cousins, you know, uncles and make us read Bible verses. And uh, um, she would, Um, set us outside and let us pick plums from the tree. Um, She was just, it was just a great, great time. And also the house was the biggest house on the block as well. So I think um, even though it was tacitly, it was a source of pride to be living in the big white house on the corner. Um, So yeah, so 
uh, I, she, she was one of the few people that owned a home in the family. So it was really important to me, a source of pride. So source of pride. And first of all, there's something about that image of the plums too, that just like lands yeah. hard. <laughs> um, but why take the step from source of pride place with good mm -hmm. memories to saying our slice of the American dream. How would owning that home mean, there we go, we got a slice of that thing? Yeah, well, I think it was also in thinking about what happened, um, I don't, must have been the early 2000s, maybe the late 1990s, uh, possibly late 1980s, when the neighborhood was changing, right? I can remember um, white men in suits walking around asking people if they wanted to sell their homes uh, and or, or they were doing other things too, you know, selling si aluminum siding for your house and uh, filters for the water. But it, soon enough, they came around asking if people wanted to sell their homes. And so, uh, you know, we're taught that um, the American dream is a home and, you know, two kids and a picket fence and a home. And so i I believed in that because that's what I was taught. And to have a member of my family have that part of the American dream when other members didn't have it, it really seemed Im important to me. And then, you know, when I got old and I realized um, I didn't have the name gentrification to apply to it, but I did realize that people that didn't look like the people that were occupying the community were coming in and displacing people, um, that that was a, was a problem. Um, and so uh, if the American dream is what they tell us, then we all should own a home. <laughs> if the American dream is what they tell us, we all should own a home. Is the American dream what they tell us? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 Absolutely not. Um, but it, it sounds good and it's, uh, it creates aspirations. Um, I guess it also creates a lot of disappointment. I mean, how do we create, like, we think about like real estate, you know, yeah, there's some sound investment for you. But if we think about how real estate is valued, right? And with like what home, like a home in a depressed neighborhood, which if it's depressed, someone depressed it is worth X amount of dollars versus if you take that same structure and put it elsewhere in a, in a neighborhood of affluence and it's worth, worth a different amount of money. And so, you know, when I got to thinking about, and I know I'm jumping ahead about survival math and thinking about the ways in which Northeast Portland was created and the values of homes and who was able to own them and who wasn't, you really start to see how phantasmagoric the, the American dream is for, for most of the people and people that look like me. We're told the same things about the American dream, that we meaning uh, people of color, black people, people have been disenfranchised. We're told this, we're sold the same story. If we're, we're talking about storytelling, we're sold the same story. And then we are actively denied the means of uh, realizing that story. Right. So no one tells you about redlining when they say go get a house. <laughs> yeah, that's why I guess six and Mason thinking about Northeast Portland here. Here's this dream. Look. Look at the risks that come with your taking that dream seriously. Yeah, yeah. That said, you describe yourself in survival math as uh, a dreaming dreamer. Mm. Uh, and, and you, in residue years, in survival math, and everything I've read of yours, the dream mm -hmm. is so alive, mm -hmm. explicitly and implicitly. Okay, so can I, like... Uh, Given the risks of the dream or of dream, mm -hmm. why do you think that for you seems like such a palpable part of who you are? I mean, I, mean, it's, I kind of see it as like there's two options, right? You can give up or you can, for lack of a better term, make something of yourself. And to, to realize the life that I have now had to involve dreaming because I didn't recognize, it was not something that was presented to me as a possibility. I, I never saw an author in my school. I didn't go to readings. I did not own a bookshelf in my house where I was 
picking books off the shelf. No one was reading to me at bedtime. All of the kind of markers of my peers that I, I the stories that I hear them tell about why they love words and books and sentences and why they wanted to be a writer. And even the kind of life that you can obtain from writing, like being a professor or that just wasn't a possibility for me. But I also knew that I did not want to let the circumstances dictate hmm. a life for me that felt really anonymous, I guess is, is, is probably the best. Like, I didn't want to live anonymous. Um, and so while I didn't have a, like a specific dream when I was young, I knew that I wanted to matter. Hmm. To matter. And you also said you didn't want to remain anonymous. And I, I guess there are two questions that I have in my head. And the first is about whether you think, is there like one American dream that we should think about no matter where we come from, no matter what color we are, no matter what gender we are? Is that a useful thing? I don't think it's useful to hold up in front of ourselves. I think the purpose of a singular American dream is a master narrative, right? It's the way that white people tell themselves we are the best. They, 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 they make the metrics and then they judge how well they've achieved the metrics. And then everyone else is judged by those same metrics, no matter what kind of access they have to achieving them. So, yeah, I, I think it serves a purpose, right? It makes us homogeneous. Um, and, and that is to a homogeneous population serves the people who, who pull the strings. When I think about conventions and, and master narratives, I'm like, well, who are they benefiting? And, and oftentimes they don't benefit people that look like me. Do you feel like there's, I think I want to ask, like, could you boil down? Is it possible to boil down what you think the sort of story of what manhood is? I was just rereading a little bit of uh, France Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask. And uh, he has that line that I had highlighted. What is it? The black man wants to be white and the white man desperately uh, wants to achieve the rank of man. And I think that when we think about manhood, again, we all have similar metrics because we've been indoctrinated to think of manhood in a certain way that you can provide, that you, you can safeguard your, your, your loved ones, that you have some standing in the world. And then, you know, what happens when you can't provide or you can't keep your people safe, or mm -hmm. your standing in the world is diminished. And so really, I think manhood, or if we're really talking specifically about black manhood, it's, mm -hmm. it's the dissonance between those standards that everyone has accepted, or many have accepted, and the actual possibilities of what we can achieve. And which makes me think that's why the idea of respect Right, something that's intangible, but the idea of respect is so integral to, to black manhood. Earlier, Mitchell talked about not having examples of writers in front of him at home and at school. In survival math, he talked about men in his life who are engaged in things that are considered criminal. In some cases, selling drugs, some sex prostitution, and violence that threatens to catch him on either side. He writes that he doesn't know how he came out of it without either killing or being killed. I wanted to know how he, now a writing professor, understands that journey. Before I figured it out, I had figured out some things about myself. One, um, I don't think I ever had, I, I didn't, I, it was hard to make me feel affronted, right? So, so my sense of respect was, I think, a little more malleable than a lot of my peers. Um, and I, so, so that would uh, govern the kind of reactions I would have or the way that I would deal with situations of conflict where manhood became uh, an aspect that was in question. I also am fortunate that I had people, when I was very young, I, I can remember my third grade teacher, Ms. Peterson, um, telling me that I was smart, you know, and, and it's, it's a small thing, but actually here I am 46 years old uh, recalling when Miss Peterson called me smart in third grade at King's School. So it did have uh, an effect on me. And, and I held on to that as part of my identity. 
right? I didn't let go of that in sixth grade. Like some people like, oh, well, school is not cool anymore. There was never a point in my life when I thought school was uncool. Um, I was also very fortunate when I got into my teens to have a group of men around me, some of whom I just wrote about in a story, who all were athletes. And our identity became that of athletes versus other identities that we could have assumed. And even if some of us were on the periphery of, you know, gang membership or dabbling in street stuff, we all were also basketball players. And the thing about it is the community was so small that people would refer you by the identity that they knew you by, right? So they would say, oh, he's, they're going to Mitch, he's a hooper, right? And so at a certain point, and I, I start to take pride in that, you know, they could be like, oh, there go Mitch, he's a crip. And I would have had a, a lot less pride in that. But then some, mm-hmm. some men or some young men start to take a pride in that as an identity, right? And once that becomes your identity, well, there's a lot of places you got to take it to become the best mm-hmm. of that. Somehow this is making me think of that moment in residue years where Champ is in the professor's office. And the professor says, you do great in politics. Feels like yeah. this has been a very political conversation. Feels like much of your writing is not explicitly about the political process, but is deeply political. So can I, like, where, yeah. where does the political stand for you? Uh, the political stands for me and the personal um, I, I, you know, I think if we can talk about like the evolution of, well, there was a book called Oversoul before there was residue years and then there was survival math. The residue years feels like a personal examination of the circumstances of my kind of intimate family members. So my mom, my two brothers, and it also was when my vision of Northeast Portland was much more myopic. I was concerned with the, the people who I had contact with. Then when I wrote Survival Math and really, you know, thinking about the state constitution and the uh, exclusion of Black people in Oregon state constitution, I started to think more broadly about how Oregon became Oregon. And you couldn't do that without also exploring whiteness. Um, so then that took me, it, it expanded the scope. So, so survival map has a much broader scope than, uh, than residue does. And, but it's always to me, if, the, if my people aren't at the center of it, then I don't wanna do it. Cause I'm not, I'm not a historian. I'm not a journalist, right? Like I am a writer and a, and a, and a storyteller. And so to me, Writing about home, thinking about home is both a personal act, and I cannot talk about the personal without being political because the political shapes the circumstances of the people that I love. Hmm. That was a beautiful journey, even in that response. <laughs> like, um, after, you, after you observe in survival math that you hadn't had conversations about politics with your mom, you, you ask her, what's, what's patriotism? Yes. Do you remember what she said? She said, um, she said something like, um, you know, we always think of America as, uh, the, as something like a father figure. But she said, yeah. uh, what if America is like our child that we have to protect? Um, and I, 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 I probably butchered that, but the idea was that it wasn't above us, that it was a, an, uh, an entity or an idea that we had to protect. And the analogy that she gave is like, when, you're, when your child is wrong, you still defend them or you still stand by them. And mm-hmm. so people who are nationalists, who know that America is committing these horrible atrocities all over the globe, but still are like, you know, red, white, and blue, and you know, I'm a, I'm an American through and through. Uh, so I, when she said it, I was like, wow, for someone who hadn't really had those kind of considerations, that seemed a really astute and uh, way to to think about uh, America and nationalism and patriotism. Yeah, it's actually really powerful to hear you say that too. That that it's like a child we love and know needs some teaching yeah rather than a parent 
teaching us towards the beginning of survival math. You talk about Mitzrayim, um, yeah, Egypt, the boon of a chance to become, um, which seems related to dreaming. This idea of becoming, yeah. yeah. Seems like you've done a lot of thinking about becoming and a lot of becoming. Uh, what, what do you like? What do you think it takes to become what you hope to become? Um, I think um, ambition, which is probably code word for hope. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to imagine a person who was not hopeful and yet ambitious, that doesn't seem like that could exist. Um, I also think a recognition of possibilities, right? So the more that you see that's possible for yourself, the greater your ambitions can be. Um, and I also think there was, um, one of the things that I tell my students in class is, you know, it's very helpful for me to point out when you can't write a sentence well, or if you can't create a metaphor, well, but it's also important for me to point out your strengths. And so I think that we should also be able to keep track of our strengths because I think knowing that can also point you in a direction, right? I had professors tell me or teachers tell me that they thought I had an aptitude for writing. It wasn't creative writing, but but I but again, I thought about that when it was time to to, to apply for graduate school. Like maybe what they said was was right. Maybe I can do this. Um, so, uh, recognizing our strengths, I guess you would also have to recognize your weaknesses, um, holding on to hope, which is a, a kind of ambition. Um, and I think also we just can't devalue mentorship. I mean, at every stage in my life, there was someone who was pointing me in the right direction and giving me encouragement. I just attended, um, my old, um, high school. He was my high school counselor and then my junior college basketball coach, a man named Donald Dixon, who retired from Jefferson High School after either 42 or 44 years of service um, in the Portland public school system. Uh, and he was the one that told me to um, take apply for a college um, scholarship that wasn't basketball related at Portland State, which is a scholarship they held for me while I was in prison. So that changed my life. There was, uh, you know, Tony Hobson and Ray Leary who created um, Self Enhancement Incorporated when I was young. I think the first camp was 1984. Um, and so gave me a job when I was in high school, um, you know, allowed me to go to camp and, 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 and stay constructive when I could have been, who knows, wandering, doing what else. Um, there was Gordon Lish when I got out of graduate school and was kind of faltering as a writer in New York. And he would call me late at night and say, I, I think you can make it, you know, stick with me. You'll be great. Um, and, and, and that encouragement really kept me going. So at every stage, there was someone saying, I think you can do it. And, and oftentimes I think that might be all that a person needs. Mitchell S. Jackson is a Pulitzer Prize-winning essayist and author who grew up in Portland, Oregon. Omar el Akkad is an author and journalist. He was born in Egypt, grew up in Qatar, moved to Canada as a teenager, and has lived for a good while in the Portland area. The start of his journalism career coincided with the start of the War on Terror, and over the following decade, he reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and many other locations around the world. His fiction and nonfiction writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Guernica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines, and has written two powerful and celebrated novels, American War and What Strange Paradise. It takes just a moment of listening to Omar, or reading him, to know that you'll be moved, challenged, and inspired and in this conversation, he's especially good at exploring national myths, the stories we tell ourselves and cling to and revise as we try, alone and with each other, to make our way through the world. I got to know this country from a distance. So I was born in Egypt, but I, I left Egypt. My father had to get out of the country. And, and I grew up in Qatar, just tiny little peninsula sticking out of 
out of Saudi Arabia. And Qatar, you know, now is, is sort of pound for pound the richest place on earth. They have massive natural gas and oil reserves. And, but there was no local cultural industry. Uh, it's sort of a Bedouin culture historically. And, and so there was, there was two TV channels. There was Qatar 1, Qatar 2. Qatar 1 was in Arabic, Qatar 2 was in English, and imported two TV shows from the U.S., MacGyver and America's Most Wanted. I have no idea why they picked those two. But it, you got a very specific interpretation of what this place over there might be like. Um, I understood America as a piece of mythology long before I understood it as anything concrete. Hmm. I didn't move to this country until I was in my 30s. Um, but you come to think of it as a certain set of possibilities the primary one, the one at the top of the list, is that this is a place where you will be left alone to think what you want, to say what you want, to do what you want. Which for someone growing up in my part of the planet mm. is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Because you can't do that back in Egypt. You can't do that in Qatar. You say the wrong thing mm. and there are very real consequences ranging from deportation to secret prisons and torture and never being heard from again. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I assumed that America was oriented around that and that no matter what else I learned about America, it was always subservient to that. Mm. And of course, many years later, I came here and realized that A, I don't understand this country in the slightest, and B, that interpretation of life here is constantly colliding against the reality that you're not going to be left alone that if you have the wrong skin color and you're pulled over, things might go very, very differently mm -hmm. from what the mythology teaches you about the freedom to be in this, mm -hmm. in this part of the world. Or in my case, if you have the wrong ethnicity and you're walking through TSA, you're walking through security and you say the wrong thing, you're going to get a very different interpretation. And yet that mythology, that idea that you can be left alone is so strong that it still resonates in my head and it's still the first thing that I associate with America even though I'm shown repeatedly mm -hmm. that that's, that's not the case. It's interesting because the way you started talking about the mythology that you, you wrote, Americans Prize Above All Else, was <clears throat> in a way from your perspective as someone who was not here. And I guess I wonder now that you've been here for a while, does it feel like the mythology that you see... Uh, say, generated here in some deliberate or accidental way, does it depart from, is it different from the kind of you're going to be left alone, the one that you saw from Egypt or Qatar? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I first moved, when I first moved to Portland, um, my buddy Donnie and I wanted to go hiking, right? And we heard about this abandoned railroad track, mm -hmm. Um, that sort of just runs into the forest. And that sounded like a really great hike. So we're, we're driving through these back roads to try and get to it. And we're sort of horribly lost from the go, from the get-go. And um, at one point, we're on this dirt road in the middle of nowhere, and we just hear gunfire. Like we just hear... And for some reason, we're like, hey, we should find out what's going on instead of the rational thing to do, which is just throw this thing into reverse and get, get the hell out of there. Right. And eventually we come into a clearing on the side of the road where there is a makeshift firing range. Mm. And it's just a bunch of guys with guns and they're just firing into, I don't know, plywood or whatever mm. it is. And a couple of the, the sort of fake body, you know, those things from the yeah. movies, I, don't, I have no idea what they're called, but have um, printouts of like Hillary Clinton's face on them. Mm -hmm. And you think about it and, and in a way that's, that's part of the mythology of America being a place where you can do whatever you want. You sure. can go out into the forest and shoot pictures of Hillary Clinton with your rifle. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, but it's so far removed from looking at this place from a distance mm -hmm. where it's land of the free, where it's, it has a veneer of goodness mm -hmm. that is implicit, but then you come here and realize that it's not guaranteed. At, at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's an incredibly powerful cultural tool set for both good and bad. In Canada, do you have to do that sort of reading of how you're going to be slotted or categorized, or do you find that that has been more the case here? There, there's, there's certainly overlaps, 
at least from my very limited experience. Um, but there's also certain load-bearing beams of the mythology that are fundamentally different. So in Canada, it's the mosaic, the idea that Canada is a mosaic of different cultures. Mm -hmm. And you go to a place like Toronto and you see that, you see this idea. Whereas in the U.S., the, the, the default sort of metaphor is the melting pot. Mm -hmm. You know, you come here... And yeah, there's different cultures, but you melt into something called American and you, you become that. And that's, that's a pretty key difference. Mm -hmm. There's tons of overlap in the sense of like where you feel like you belong and where you feel like you don't belong. There's certainly that. But there's also something distinctly American that I haven't, I haven't seen that flavor anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so if there's some push towards the melt, the melting pot, um, again in... What Strange Paradise, uh, there's a mention of the sort of story as a story about all men being equal. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, what are the things that people would say are core to the American dream? And I think one at least aspirational piece of it is something like everybody has an equal opportunity, something like that. And I guess, first I wonder, does that seem like it's core at least to the dream part of it? to you as you've gotten to know this place and this dream as it came to you in different? I mean, foundationally, it's contradicted by the history of the country. I know that we have this debate ongoing right now, but it, it isn't really a debate. You know, the, the, the economic expansion of this country was predicated on the enslavement of a group of human beings and the geographic uh, expansion of this country was predicated on the massacre of a group of human beings. That's not me freelancing opinions. That's a matter of historical record. And the fact that we're having these debates now about uh, so-called critical race theory and what books Texas wants to ban and, and all the rest of that is a sideshow. Mm. It's a sideshow relative to the historical record. So in a sense, the notion that it is written in one of the founding documents is all well and good, but it is contradicted by the history of the country. That doesn't mean that the entirety of the endeavor is, is hopeless, but it means that you have to acknowledge what the reality is. So I think that in certain ways, you know, there, there's kind of the, the Fox News model of thinking about America, where if you say the slogan, the slogan becomes reality. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, is, is one of the things that scares me the most about the institutional integrity of this thing called America, which is this notion that there is a significant part of the culture with its load-bearing beams being the Fox Newses of the world and the Republican parties and, and those entities... Mm -hmm that firmly believes that if you say a thing loudly enough and often enough, mm -hmm. it will be indistinguishable from the truth, that there is a frictionless overlap between the truth and what you'd like the truth to be. Mm. And that, that terrifies me because it leads to these situations where you can just throw the, the headline, all men are created equal or this is a place, and somehow use that to sort of wash over the reality and the nuances mm -hmm. of how the country actually functions. That's, that's a really scary place to be. So when you started using the word scared and then came back to it at the end, I started thinking about your book, American War, uh, which feels so different from what Strange Paradise in that <clears throat> there are certainly overlaps. Uh, but American War, you're looking forward about 50, 70 years and envisioning the Second World War, uh, sorry, the Second Civil War. Um, and it's a thoroughly different America in some ways and a thoroughly recognizable America in others. Now, that book came out about five years ago now. Um, in that time, a lot of people are talking about Civil War or the prospect of Civil War and about how we are different countries within one country. Um, I guess I wonder when you think about that book now, uh, do you remember what drove the writing of that book and the envisioning of a second civil war? I remember the genesis moment of American war, and I often go back to this, which is uh, I was watching an American TV news. I don't remember if it was CNN or one of the other networks, but it was. this was many, many years ago in the early days of the NATO invasion of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. 
And they were interviewing this foreign affairs expert, this talking head. And a few days earlier, there had been these protests in Afghanistan. Villagers were protesting against the U.S. military presence. And the question that was put to this gentleman was, why do they hate us so much? Mm -hmm. And in his answer, he said, well... You know, sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And when they do this, they will often ransack the houses or hold the women and children at gunpoint. And then he very helpfully added, um, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. <laughs> and I still remember that. I mean, it's, 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 it betrays a kind of... Yeah a sense of, of th these people belong on a different planet. Hmm. You know, look at their bizarre customs of getting offended when, when armed men come into their house. Um, and I wanted to attack that as much as possible. So that was the thinking behind, behind American War. What happened was I finished writing the first draft in the summer uh, of 2015. And about three weeks later, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. The book comes out, ends up coming out four months into the Trump administration in 2017 mm -hmm. and is immediately slotted on all these article lists of like, you know, the first books of the Trump era and the books you need to understand to, to learn about. Even to this day, recently somebody posted this thing on Twitter calling it utter trash because um, it was, it, this person had read it as a piece of pro-Trump propaganda because the states that, that secede in the book are, um, what is it, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and it's called the MAG. Mm -hmm. And he was like, MAG, MAGA, this person's pro-Trump. And I couldn't, you're not going to reach out to everybody on Twitter and be like, I swear to God I wrote this book before, yeah, yeah. before any of this happened. I don't think that I, that I predicted anything. I don't think I intruded on reality. I think reality started to intrude on the fictional, and that's why that book has had a a strange kind of life and a strange kind of resonance in whatever America has become since since it came out. It's interesting what you say about the the funny MAG, almost MAGA, because I think that book, my guess is one of the reasons that book resonates is because <clears throat> it's kind of the American nightmare. I think it touches on like America losing its international power. So ceasing to be an empire. Uh, our trouble with natural resources turning into trouble with each other, where it starts with uh, fossil fuels no longer being of value and then pretty soon there's scarcity that drives us to go after each other in ways we maybe had started to, but it elevates it. And then that the country is so split in familiar ways. And I, <clears throat> all of those are detectable currents right now. Uh, so that it feels like 2075? Maybe the hopeful part of American War is that it took that long. I've been criticized for that now, so like of casting it too far. Yeah, there was an article a, a couple of days ago, I think, in the Washington Post talking about the fas how fashionable it's become to write about, you know, Civil War scenarios and saying that the, the least fashionable thing about my book was that really? it cast forward 50 years. Um, yeah, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, when I first started thinking about this conversation, when you first reached out to me about, you know, of, of all of the, those kinds of scenarios. And it is, it is fashionable to talk about that right now. And, and that's as a result of, of where the country is. Yeah. Um, but the one, of all the ones that come to mind, the one at the very top, the existential threat that scares me more than, than any other, is that you have a society that it's every vector is oriented away from the communal good and towards the individual good. And that's a function of capitalism. It's a function of the free market economy. It's a function of the mythology of coming here and being the self-made man and mm -hmm. the Rockefellers of the world and all, all the rest of that. But every vector in terms of institutional, societal, seems oriented away from the communal good and towards the individual good. And we are colliding against a moment in time where the scariest things that are happening to us require a response that orients those vectors in the exact opposite direction, hmm. away from the individual good and towards the communal good. Please put on a mask. Yeah, okay, it's for you maybe, but it's also for all these other people. Please get the vaccine, it'll help you, but also there's a bunch of people here who are more vulnerable than you. Please do it for them. And, and setting all of that aside, 
we are we're in the middle of a pandemic right now where we're talking about these individual actions as opposed to institutional actions or things the government can do. Same thing with climate change. Mm-hmm. Hey, we have this thing that could possibly wipe out the species, recycle better and and bike more and do those things. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, there's a bunch of companies over here that are creating that are contributing to this problem more in a day than you will in several lifetimes, but please, like, you know, go organic or do the thing that you need. Because, again, we live in this society that that has so tailored everything towards the individual good that we, I don't know how we solve these coming problems that are cataclysmic Mm -hmm. and require a communal effort. They require the exact opposite of so much of culturally what culturally forms the bedrock of the society we live in. And I want to ask you uh, about how constitutive stories get changed. And I ask that question with a couple of the moments uh, in What Strange Paradise in mind, especially the one where there's one guy on the boat who, he, who again, Muhammad says to him, You know, you can tell how well people are going to do when they make this crossing, not by anything they say, but by what they bring with them. And you're in trouble because you're bringing a book. And the people with books, they don't do so well. So I guess I want to ask you as a storyteller, how do you change the story? Do you have hopes for the possibility of changing the story from an individualistic story to a more collective story? I, I sort of have to to keep doing what I do, right? And even if it's full-on delusion, I, I have to believe that there's an element of change that's possible. But also I have I have a kind of statistical and anecdotal evidence-based to look at, to look at the stories that I can go into a bookstore right now and pick up mm-hmm. that a decade or two ago would have never gotten any any sort of um, institutional traction. They wouldn't have been considered worth telling because uh, the gatekeepers are are of a particular worldview, and and had that not changed or been diversified, those books would have never come out in the first place. So I have some evidence base to suggest that this is possible. The problem again is that you know individually, as an individual writer, I'm sort of throwing pebbles into the ocean. Um, Mm -hmm. And I have to, because of the stuff I write about, I have to convince myself that it is possible that these stories are going to change someone's worldview or they're going to cause them to think about something in a way they haven't before or consider somebody as human that previously they might have thought of as only scenery. Mm. I have to believe that. So there are two functions of this. One is pure delusion, pure self-delusion that I have to, whether it's real or not, doesn't matter in the slightest. In order for me to keep writing the books I write, I have to believe it. But the other is real tangible change Mm -hmm. in terms of what kind of stories get told. And I think the other way that you can identify that that is happening is this deranged knee-jerk reaction now where people are, are going back to a mode that historically has been associated with the worst crimes that we are capable of as a society, which is banning books, mm. getting rid of information. That wouldn't be happening if, if this work wasn't having an effect. You're listening to The Detour with Omar el Akkad. I I'm one of those people who doesn't have a very good answer to that question, where are you from? You know, I was born in one place. I I, I grew up in another. I'm a citizen of two countries now. I just got my American citizenship during a very bizarre uh, citizenship question. I I don't know know how much you know about these things, but they sit you down and they're like, uh, so everybody's done a little human smuggling. Have you ever done any human smuggling? You know, it's like 20 (laughs) minutes of, of just like, have you ever kept someone from practicing their religion? Have you ever murdered, you know? Um... And it was terrifying. It was a very, yeah. it was very scary. Um, I answered no to all of them. Good. By the way, that's, just, that just sounds to, like just to, in case you're second guessing your decision to have me up on stage here. But anyway, <laughs> this notion of of not being able to point to any geography, yeah. any set of cultural lineage, and say this is this is mine, mm-hmm. runs through a lot of the characters in my stories, um, and that has to do with your question about loyalty. 
Um, I have never once thought of my loyalties as having anything remotely to do with the nation state. I don't care in the slightest about borders. Um, I consider my relationship with the nation state to be purely a business relationship. Mm -hmm. There's a certain set of rules I have to follow and this is what I get in return and so on and so forth. I've never had that kind of nationalism, patriotism. It's just not me. And that's not a criticism of somebody who bases their entire worldview on that. And some of my favorite writers are people who marinated in one spot Mm -hmm. and they told the story of that place to a certain depth that I will never be able to reach because of the kind of life I've had. So when you talk about the word loyalty, it's a really interesting question to me because I don't have the prerequisite life Mm. to think of loyalty as a stable thing anchored to to anything unchanging, let alone a nation. Mm. When I think of home, when I think of what home is, Mm. I very rarely think of a place. I th- home for me is is relational. Mm-hmm. I think of relationships as designating what home is, where I feel most comfortable. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of something like Nagib Mahfouz's famous phrase about home. Home isn't necessarily where you were born. Home is where your attempts to escape cease. Um, and and so, my attempts to escape cease on relational terms. <sighs> There's never been a place I've lived in that some part of my head wasn't thinking about getting out of. Mm. Um, And that's probably going to stick with me for the rest of my life. And so these characters, when they think of loyalty, it's a relational thing because in large part, home is becoming a relational thing. Um, In some cases, it's physically taken away from you. Mm. In some of these stories, you have situations where you can't live in the place you used to live. You're forced out. In other places, you feel ill at ease in your environment. You feel like... Something about me doesn't fit with this place. And so you end up developing a relationship with a negative space, the absence of of a home. Um, And that's certainly been my experience. It's not the right one. It's not the wrong one. It's just a function of the kind of life I've had that when I think of home, I think of particular situations. I think of particular relationships. I think of particular memories that taken together constitute home for me. Mm-hmm. I certainly don't think of a location. Mm-hmm. And primarily interpersonal relationships, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm thinking about another character on the boat in What Strange Paradise. The character, and again, I'm going to ask about pronouncing his name, Maher. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to read it uh, He's arguing with Muhammad, who again, Muhammad seems like the voice of crude reality often. And and Maher says, one should try to believe in things. And again, he's a literature student and he's from Gaza. So these words in in this man's mouth, one should try to believe in things, he said, even if they let you down afterward. So I read that sentence a bunch of times. One should try to believe in things even if they let you down afterward. And I wanted to ask you maybe as we move towards the close of this first part of the program, is America something one should try to believe in even knowing we're likely to be let down? Um, so the, the, that, that conversation in the book, you know, he says that line and then Muhammad says, what the hell are you talking about? And Maher says, oh, it's something my favorite writer once said. And then Muhammad says, your favorite writer is wrong. You know, we've been sitting here for an hour and I've said pretty well everything that's on my mind about America without a second thought. The criticism, Hmm. the flaws I see in this country, the places that terrify me. If we had been doing this version of, like this conversation, but in Cairo, and I was saying the same things about Egypt and the Egyptian government and Egyptian society there's a very good chance that the lights would have gone down about halfway through and nobody would have ever heard from me again. Hmm. So I don't want to sort of veer into this very lazy space Mm -hmm. of the equal, you know, everything is equal across the board with respect to, oh, they have one kind of repression here and they have one kind. That's not true. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Um, James Baldwin talks about it's a famous, one of many famous quotes of Baldwin's about, uh, about 
this notion that it is precisely because you love this country that you insist on your right to criticize her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I love this country or any other country, Mm -hmm. but many, many years ago, I was indoctrinated with a particular story about what this country could be. And my belief in that story and its negation of the kind of intellectual and psychological and emotional corseting that I felt growing up on the other side of the planet, the sense of not being able to say, that is of such overwhelming power for me that I will believe in what this country could be to my dying day, even though every morning I wake up and I'm faced with evidence that the exact opposite country exists. Omar el Akkad is a journalist and award-winning author of American War and What Strange Paradise. You can find the full conversations with Mitchell and Omar in our show notes at oregonhumanities.org. The detour is made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm Adam Davis. Kieran Bond is our producer. Our editor and engineer is Dave Friedlander. Our assistant producers are Alexandra Powell Bugden, Karina Brisky, and Ben Waterhouse. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. Thank you.